Amigues, amics, benvingudes i benvinguts a les setzenes Jornades Catalanes d'Informació, perdó, Jornades Catalanes d'Informació i Documentació. Donem el tret de sortida a unes jornades molt especials, molt especials perquè creiem que som essencials. A més a més, tingueu en compte que treballem tres àmbits d'actuació. D'acord amb el subtítol, parlarem de lideratge professional, de comunitats actives i de recursos de primera necessitat, perquè creiem que som recursos de primera necessitat. Són unes jornades que han estat possibles gràcies a un treball en equip, fonamentat en els valors d'aquesta Junta 2024, que són el treball, la tenacitat i la transparència. En tot aquest engranatge voldríem fer un especial esment als nostres coorganitzadors, que són la Universitat Politècnica de Catalunya, que ens ha cedit un dels seus espais més emblemàtics, i després el Departament de Cultura de la Generalitat de Catalunya, que ens cedeix els espais de la Biblioteca Pública Carles Raola de Girona, que, com sabeu, s'hi duran a terme la tercera jornada d'aquest event. Finalment, i una vegada feta aquesta primera salutació, Voldria donar la paraula al senyor Joan Gispets, vicerrector de Política Universitària de la Universitat Politècnica de Catalunya, al senyor Josep Vives i Gràcia, director general de Promoció Cultural i Biblioteques del Departament de Cultura de la Generalitat de Catalunya i, finalment, farà l'obertura el senyor Francesc Xavier González Quadra, president del Col·legi Oficial de Bibliotecaris i Documentalistes de Catalunya. Gràcies per haver vingut i comencem. Gràcies. Bé, bon dia. Benvolgut president del Col·legi Oficial de Bibliotecaris Documentalistes de Catalunya, membres de la Junta, senyores i senyors. En nom del rector i de tot l'equip de govern de l'UPC, us donem la benvinguda al campus nord de la nostra universitat i desitgem que les setzenes jornades catalanes d'informació i documentació siguin un èxit. Em consta que és la primera vegada que trien els espais de l'UPC per a les jornades de referència en els camps de la informació i la documentació. I desitjo que us sentiu molt ben acollits i que tot es desenvolupi segons el previst. Vull felicitar i donar les gràcies als membres de l'organització de les jornades per la bona feina que han fet. Em consta que han tingut els resultats desitjats, arribant a la màxima capacitat d'inscripció que s'havien plantejat. 400 professionals vinguts de tot el territori català. Com a vicerrector de Política Universitària, acabat d'incorporar abans d'ahir, tinc, entre altres, el repte de repensar l'experiència d'aprenentatge a la meva universitat. En la qual les biblioteques tindran un paper important. Com a ciutadà i amant del llibre i la lectura, em plourà molt conèixer les inquietuds i els reptes de les biblioteques escolars i les biblioteques públiques. Les biblioteques i els bibliotecaris sou, com indica el lema de les jornades, essencials. Us necessitem per impulsar comunitats actives per, com diu Erri de Luca, utilitzar la força educativa incendiària de les paraules. Aquestes jornades ens permetran escoltar gent que està fent... Ens permetran escoltar com està sent acollida la nova Biblioteca Pública d'Oslo i saber què en podrem aprendre per l'anhelada nova Biblioteca de Barcelona. El programa presenta contingut ben alineat amb les preguntes clau que es fa avui qualsevol institució cultural i o acadèmica, com la UPC. Quin és el paper de la ciència oberta? Quines són o haurien de ser les polítiques de foment de lectura a l'edat d'adolescent? Quin és el paper de la intel·ligència artificial en el foment de la lectura? Tot ens interpel·la i ens uneix. Avui, els 118 professionals vinculats a les nostres 12 biblioteques universitàries tenen la possibilitat d'escoltar les novetats del sector. La nostra directora de l'Àrea de Cultura i Comunitat 
moderarà la taula rodona sobre biblioteques universitàries i ens anirà bé tenir en quilòmetre zero respostes a preguntes que totes les universitats ens estem fent. El mes de novembre tindrem l'oportunitat d'acollir aquí mateix les jornades Reviun i aprofundir en el món de les biblioteques universitàries. Que una universitat politècnica aculli aquesta mena de diàlegs entronca amb la voluntat de normalitzar debats humanístics als nostres campus. Que les biblioteques públiques incorporin més divulgació científica i tècnica és una aliança que necessitem explorar conjuntament. Que les biblioteques escolars deixin de ser una promesa per ser una revolució també és feina de tots. Així doncs, sigueu molt benvinguts a l'UPC i que les jornades siguin un gran èxit. Estarem atents. Ja ens fem grans. Bon dia, vicerrector de Polítiques Universitàries, Joan Gispet, Xavier González, president del Col·legi, Carme Galve, també del Col·legi, col·legues bibliotecaris i bibliotecàries. Bon dia a tothom. Gràcies en primer lloc per convidar el Departament de Cultura de la Generalitat a donar la benvinguda en aquesta nova edició de les Jornades Catalanes de Documentació. Aquestes jornades, com ha avançat el vicerrector, tindran lloc aquí, a la Universitat Politécnica de Catalunya i a la Biblioteca Pública de Girona, Carles Raola, dos espais que tenen especial rellevància personal per a mi. La Politécnica, perquè és una de les institucions que més m'ha marcat professionalment com a bibliotecari, gràcies als companys i companyes amb els quals vaig treballar durant uns quants anys, i per motius obvis la Biblioteca Pública de Girona, que com sabeu és una de les tres biblioteques que gestiona directament el Departament de Cultura. Essencials. Aquest és el lema que enguany ens proposa el Col·legi per tractar una multitud de temes professionals que ens preocupen i ocupen a tots. Tant de bo no haguéssim patit cap pandèmia, però malauradament això no està a les nostres mans. Sí que podem, però, aprendre del passat. Passat, que poso entre cometes, perquè el virus encara està per aquí donant voltes. Segurament hem après encara viva allò que fins ara s'explicava en cursos de gestió o de superació personal sobre la piràmide de Maslow. Les persones no tenim només la necessitat de menjar, d'estar sans o de gaudir de certa seguretat. En tenim d'altres i és en aquest context que ràpidament accedir a la cultura i disposar d'una informació fiable van esdevenir essencials per a tots nosaltres. Vam passar d'un primer moment de salvaguardar necessàriament per sobre de tot la vida de les persones, especialment la dels més vulnerables, a aprendre a conviure amb el virus i anar reprenent a poc a poc la nostra vida, també la cultural. En aquest context, el conjunt de les biblioteques vau treballar des del primer moment per ajudar a superar la crisi, cadascuna des de la seva especialitat i expertesa, ja fos facilitant l'accés a la producció científica, difonent informació de qualitat per a la ciutadania en general o garantint l'accés a les seves col·leccions i activitats. I sí, podríem afirmar que les biblioteques i els centres d'informació i documentació van resultar essencials per a moltes persones i institucions. És de justícia reconèixer-ho i penso que és obligat a aprofitar aquesta oportunitat que ara tinc per mostrar l'agraïment per part del Departament de Cultura a tota la feina que heu estat fent a tots els professionals de les biblioteques aquests dos darrers anys en unes condicions molt, molt difícils per a tothom. I no són només paraules. És en aquest context de gestió de la pandèmia i postpandèmia que conceptes com l'essencialitat de la cultura, la necessitat de garantir els drets culturals i millorar el finançament de les polítiques culturals han esdevingut punt de trobada assumits per la majoria de les forces parlamentàries. I ara toca fer-ho una realitat. Els compromisos del Govern de la Generalitat de Catalunya en aquesta legislatura passen per aprovar la Llei de Drets Culturals, que explícitament ha de reconèixer que la cultura és una necessitat essencial i assolir el repte de destinar les polítiques culturals fins al 2% del pressupost de la Generalitat de Catalunya. Cultura essencial, cultura inclusiva i amb suficients recursos econòmics. Què ens permetrà això aquest any en l'àmbit competencial de la Direcció General que represento? 
podrem tornar a finançar els ajuntaments la construcció o millora de biblioteques públiques, continuar a garantir la compra de col·leccions de qualitat en format físic o digital, incrementar les actuacions en matèria de foment de la lectura i activitats culturals en general que oferim a les biblioteques, etc. També podrem dotar el nou pla de foment de la lectura, que d'entre altres objectius ens ha de permetre arribar a col·lectius o institucions on no sempre podem arribar i que també tenen dret a gaudir de la lectura i de la cultura en general. Dins d'aquest context de col·laboració amb els departaments d'educació, justícia i salut serà per nosaltres una prioritat. Amb educació, per col·laborar en la definició i extensió d'un model de biblioteca escolar. Amb salut, per tirar endavant projectes que vinculin la cultura i la lectura a la millora del benestar personal. I amb el Departament de Justícia per avançar l'accés i pràctica de la cultura en entorn de restricció de llibertat. En paral·lel, estem treballant igualment per vertebrar les diferents biblioteques especialitzades de Catalunya i poder definir una xarxa de cooperació per facilitar-los serveis i suport tècnic adequat. Crec que és un repte pendent cap a una de les xarxes més denses i variades de les que integren el sistema bibliotecari de Catalunya i que calia entomar. Finalment, aprofito per expressar públicament que pel que respecte a la construcció de la Biblioteca Pública de la Biblioteca Central de Barcelona, les tres institucions que hi participen, Ministeri de Cultura, Ajuntament de Barcelona i Generalitat, estem conjurades a fer el possible perquè les obres comencin en aquesta legislatura. I ara no faré spoilers, demà hi ha una jornada per la tarda i podrem parlar-ne. No m'allargo més. Gràcies al Col·legi per organitzar aquestes jornades, a la Politècnica i a la Biblioteca Pública de Girona per acollir-les i gràcies a tots vosaltres que heu estat al peu del canó quan els usuaris us han necessitat. Bones jornades. Hola, bon dia a tothom. Gràcies, Carme, vicerector, director general, participants, ponents, moderadors, patrocinadors, voluntaris, staff, junta... Gràcies per ser-hi. Diuen els que saben de discursos que els agraïments són el primer a mencionar. El meu Parlament o manifest que no discurs és una norma i sentit agraïment. Un agraïment sincer a tota la professió, a tota i de tots els àmbits. Un merescut agraïment pels durs temps que hem viscut i que estem superant. Només la nostra vocació innegable, esperit de servei, resiliència i enorme sapiència ens han permès superar el marasme de la pandèmia. Des de les biblioteques públiques, des de les biblioteques universitàries, des de les biblioteques escolars especialitzades, des de la nacional, des de les patrimonials, l'esforç que hem fet d'adaptació i de superació està en majúscul. No em vull estendre més, el meu no és un discurs, diguéssim, de contingut, sinó que és un discurs d'agraïment i sobretot de retrobament. En retrobem després de dos anys i mig de moments durs. Em fa molt de goig, no us ho haig de dir, no us enganyaré, que des del col·legi sigueu tants i n'hagueu vingut tants i tantes. Res dir-vos que us agraeixo molt que esteu aquí. Crec que el programa és bastant llaminer. Em sembla que ens ha quedat bé, per què no dir-ho. Espero que el gaudiu i que res, que estem aquí i sobretot que ens retrobem, perquè al final les jornades sobretot és un retrobament professional. Moltes gràcies i gràcies per ser-hi. Com deien en els parlaments institucionals, hem identificat l'essencialitat de la nostra professió i, sobretot, en temps de pandèmia. Ens hem adonat que la nostra professió rau en la comunitat i és per això que hem volgut convidar el Nutescansen. 
que és el responsable de les biblioteques d'Oslo. La xarxa de biblioteques d'Oslo consta de 22 seus, durant aquests últims set anys s'han vist renovades, però la gran joia de la corona és Deichmann Bjorvika, que és la nova biblioteca central en 20.000 metres quadrats i que es va obrir el juny del 2020, tot just quan nosaltres reobríem els nostres espais. Ens agrada molt aquest model de biblioteca perquè dona en especial atenció la interacció social. El nostre convidat centrarà la conferència en el procés de disseny i desenvolupament de les sales, però també en les competències del personal, en l'ús de la tecnologia i, sobretot, en la implicació dels usuaris. Finalment, dir-vos que aquesta conferència es farà en anglès, però també podreu trobar-la en breu al canal de YouTube del Col·legi Oficial. O sigui, que no patiu. I ja només em queda donar la paraula. Good luck, Nout. Welcome to Barcelona. Bon dia. Moltes gràcies per invitar-me. És un gran honor, realment, de llegar aquí a parlar amb vosaltres. Hablo español, mi marido es español desde los últimos 10 años, pero no hablamos de bibliotecas en casa. Tampoco hablo con mi suegra sobre bibliotecas. Y hablo mucho con mi suegra. Entonces, es más fácil para mí y para vosotros, creo también, que hablo inglés. Y, y um, si quieres hablar con mi después, puedes uh, hablar castellano, eh, no entiendo catalán, pero puedo leerlo, porque hablo bien francés, eh, pero no puedo entenderlo. Lo siento. Bueno, empezamos. No lo sé si tengo un problema técnico. Parece que sí. <laughs> Ahora. Mágico. Ok, we change to English. Uh, I will start saying something about uh, Oslo. How many of you have actually been to Oslo? No, you should come. <laughs> okay, the city of Oslo has 700,000 inhabitants. If we count the surroundings, it's approximately 1 million uh, inhabitants. We have one main public library and 18 public branch libraries, two federal prison libraries, and also the federal hospital library in the Central University Hospital. We are uh, in the public library, which is my responsibility, 370 employees, and the, the library network is 100% founded by the city of Oslo, as, except, except the federal prison and hospital library. The annual budget uh, for our organization is 43 million euros. We expect this year some 4.5 million visits in the library network and we distribute approximately 1.6 million books in different formats. And uh, before the pandemic, uh, in the last normal year, I would say, we produced some 7,000 events uh, in the library, from spanning from literature festivals to programs for schools and kindergartens. Um, shortly, by distribution and visits, Dijkman, Dijkman is the name of the library. Uh, it's named after uh, the founder of the library is far the biggest and the oldest cultural institution in Norway. Um, and approximately 55% of the population in the city use the library. Um, 
In addition, we, as I said, we, we are actually the oldest library uh, founded in 1785. Okay, let's see if it functions now. Yeah. Okay. Many cities are currently rediscovering the public library. I will talk of some of these cities later. I will, during this lecture, talk about how you can manage to convince the owner of the library, and more importantly, the user and non-user, what the public library is. Moreover, what role a public library can play in our times. During the pandemic, all libraries in Oslo stayed open to the public. Um, and um, we were actually the only public service open together with pharmacies, food stores, and public transport. And I think this shows, in a way, how the crisis made the libraries much more visible, and it changed both the mentality of our staff and, I think, the way the public look at the library. So I would say that the pandemic has repositioned the public library, and we have a momentum. I think this goes for the whole world. We had a conference in Oslo last week with 18 nations represented, and we just agreed on that. We have a momentum now after this crisis uh, to show what the library actually can do. So let me ask you then the question I often get from people that are ignorant of what a public library can do in a community. Do we still need public libraries? For most of these people, the image of the library is foremost a dusty building with old librarians and huge collections of old books, silent reading rooms, and microfilm projectors where you can search in old newspapers. This is a very dangerous assumption because it's not true. Moreover, we have usually been bad at countering this assumption. We are, in our industry, I think, very bad at telling people that is not belonging to our industry what a library really is. We are often bad at giving a responsive answer to new, new, new user needs, and by this we can easily end up recreating or repeating this image of the library, also within the library organization. And when you are building a new library, you sit down with the architect and you will very, very fast discover that this is the image they have of the library if they have not drawn a library before. It happened also with our architects in Oslo. The public library sector has evolved enormously during the last decade. And more important, the public libraries have always been the main gateway for children and young people to enter the realm, realm of literature, storytelling, and perspective. If you discover literature, knowledge, and science early in life, the chance that you live a better life, take better decisions in your life, get inspired and become a better citizen in your community is higher. Public libraries have always been the bedrock and core institution in all prospering society, societies based on a humanistic perspe perspective. And this is why law, legislation in most countries in the world regulate public libraries, because we know this. The legislation of public libraries is in many countries also related to the constitution and seen as part of the democratic infrastructure. And we need to remind ourselves and our community of the importance of this role. We too seldom we use these words when we talk about the library. And a city without a library is a, like a bird without wings. But the main problem of most and all library directors at the time around the world is, however, this one. This is not a public library. This is a cell phone. Public libraries have, since antiquity, primarily been social spaces. 
A public library consists of a collection of books stored in the building and a lot of space for dialogue, debate, interaction, learning, sharing, and talking about the past, but foremost about the future. A library is mostly about the future. You may find channels and ways of communicating via your cell phone. However, the danger or the chance that you meet someone disagreeing with you, challenging your perspective or inspiring you is minor. Probably an algorithm directs you into a digital bubble, an echo chamber that confirms your opinions and perspectives. It is, in my opinion, extremely naive to believe that this cell phone can replace one of our civilization's core institutions, the public library. Three Scandinavian cities have on this ground decided to redefine and modernize the public library as a social and democratic space. The public libraries in Aarhus in Denmark, Helsinki in Finland, and Oslo in Norway have been taking and talking about the new public library concept for two decades, and we have been cooperating closely. I will show you the images of the three libraries. They are, they are spectacular buildings. Inside, they are also spectacular, but the solution, the way we have solved the programming is very different. But the core idea, what I'm going to talk about, the transition is the same. This is DOC 1 in Aarhus in Denmark. It was inaugurated in 2015 and is today considered one of the most innovative and creative public libraries in the world. The next library conference that takes place in Aarhus every second year gathers library developers from all countries and has had been an engine for development, first in Scandinavia and now globally. I must very recommend you to, to visit it if you have a chance. The library has huge spaces for social interaction, conference, meeting, and creative processes. Audi was inaugurated in 2018, and this is Audi in Helsinki, and is as well considered one of the most innovative and creative public libraries around. 30% of this building is reserved for technology, maker spaces, and learning facilities. Only 30% is for the book collection, and they, I think they have 100,000 volumes only in this library. And then my own library, Dijkman Björvika, Oslo Public Library. Uh, we opened in June uh, 2020, just in the midst of the first year of the pandemic. And we opened after 12 years of planning, and the construction took place uh, during six years uh, before the opening. Um, and the architect competition took place in 2008. The city of Oslo has taken two fundamental steps. Firstly, our owner has acknowledged that the organization of the library space, which is room for people and not for storage of books, is a prerequisite for the public library to fulfill its mission. The old library that we moved from was organized quite the opposite the new building. In this building, 70% of the space is for the public, social spaces. Only 30% is back uh, office. We have no closed stacks at all. In the, in the old library, it was opposite. Secondly, the city of Oslo have chosen to do as Helsinki, Amsterdam, Seattle, Aarhus, and Birmingham, putting the library in the middle of the strongest traffic flow in the city. As of today, 50 million people are in transit in this area on a yearly basis. Oslo is a small country, I, I mentioned that, uh, or a small city, I mentioned 700 um, inhabitants. So 50 million in transit, it really tells you that we are just in the middle, in the hub, where everything goes on. It was designed by the architects Lund Hagem and Atelier Oslo. Uh, it's 23,000 square meters gross, 13,600 square meters net functional area, 10,000 square meters for the public, 
and the square in front uh, covered with a thin layer of water during summer and ice for skating during winter, also an important social space. The library has five floors above ground uh, and two lower floors below ground. And the capacity is 2,000 simultaneous visitors. And we have seating for 1,100 simultaneous vi visitors, but uh, also a lot of other facilities. So when it's full, it's basically 2,000 people that are in the library. In the old library that we moved from, we had a capacity for 300 seats. So you can then understand the change. The cost of this library was 350 million euro. Okay, I did mention that our library is the oldest cultural institution in Norway, founded in 1785 during the Age of Enlightenment. Carl Dijkman, this is our founder, he was a typical man of his century, spoke six languages, and had a great belief in science, facts, and the good in man. In his will, he donated a 6,000 volume book collection to the city of Oslo, then named Christiania. The condition was that a public library should open, accessible to everyone, free of charge. In addition to being a man of enlightenment, today we would call him a founder and an entrepreneur, he was basically interested in the future. The Enlightenment include a range of ideas centered on the value of human happiness, the pursuit of knowledge obtained by means of reason, and the evidence of the, of the senses, and ideals such as liberty, progress, toleration, fraternity, constitutional government, and separation of church and state, which all could be said to be the base also of a public library. All these values are still at the core of our modern institution, but they are not at the core of digital media and a cell phone, I'm afraid. Public libraries have during the last century been mostly conservative, and until a decade ago, I would not call public libraries flexible and creative institutions, at least not in Oslo. Rather, most of them has been true to the old concept of the public library, namely storing enormous quantities of books and distributing them for free. Old libraries have any book you can dream of, just in case somebody passes and look for that book. But book takes up a lot of space, and in some grotesque cases, big libraries therefore have no space for people and only space for books and then we cannot fulfill our mission. This, however, is Oslo Central Library in the 1890s, a radically modern public library room. This is a room for people, for meetings, for studying, learning, getting inspired, motivated, maybe some flirting, getting optimistic, and finding solutions and joy. I would love to go to this room. By some strange reason, we stopped building these kind of libraries during the 20th century, after we got legislation for public libraries, which of course was good. We also got regulations, standards, and almost forgot that libraries are for people and not for storing collections. The library sector during the 20th century at least in Oslo, forgot that the library is a social space. This picture is from the youth department in the central library in Oslo in the 1890s. And it says a lot about the developing understanding of the library as a bookstoring facility. Here the books are virtually protected from their users and the power relationship between the librarian and the borrower is quite clear. The librarian is the boss here. An important question we must ask ourselves is how self-understanding in the library sector developed during the 20th century. During the first decades of the 20th century, the library professionals emerged and the libraries in most of Europe received a set of standards and legislation. And then we gradually also got the public library inspection, at least we got in Norway, 
in most countries that sanction the practice. This is happening in parallel with the construction of the old main library in Oslo, which was completed in 1933, and which we had to move from and leave now. So gradually, the social space disappeared, and libraries became, like I said, bookstoring facilities. Let's ju jump forward 131 years to the branch library we have in the central borough of Tøyen in Oslo. This is another example of a very good library room. Dijkman Tøyen is one of our smallest but most popular branch libraries in Oslo. This picture was taken before the pandemic in January 2020, a Thursday night at nine o'clock in the evening. All branch libraries in Oslo are staffless, without staff, after seven o'clock in the evening, and we then close at 10 o'clock. And you can use your library card to enter the library. This is a social room it's an extension, I would say, of your home. On the 8,000 square meter in this library, we have 300,000 visits a year. And more than 25% of the visits come in the staffless time when we are not there. So this is the new living room in this community. The new post office, the new church building, the new district house, the new leisure club, the new meeting place for associations. So, do you see the similarity? Whatever business you are into, you should st start asking the famous question, why? Why? Do we need libraries? Public libraries are in most countries, like I said, secured by legislation. The reason is that most societies have understood that free access to knowledge, tools, books, and art is fundamental for the individual and for the society in creating a better future. The public library is a bedrock democratic and cultural institution. Public libraries train the future reader guarantee us that all of us have access on the best of culture and facts, all for free. Public libraries produce more equality, more integration, and more crossover meetings between people with different backgrounds, religions, sexuality, political opinion, and so on. In addition, of course, public libraries create more joy of reading, more joy of life. Public libraries are machines for letting dreams come true, for getting inspired, for meeting people you would never meet any other place, for using your voice, telling your story, and listening to others. Shortly, public libraries are machines for creating a better and more sustainable future, future and for having fun. That is why we build public libraries. And now come the painful one, not for storing books. The main problem then is that we, our focus when we talk about development very often has been for decades the collection. The collection is a tool. It is not the why, it is the what. And we also love to talk about how we do it, but we too seldom start with the why. Why do we need public libraries? When we opened the new Central Library two years ago in June 2020, we asked two Norwegian authors, Lars Sobe Christensen and Kamara Juf, to write a prologue and introduce the library to all the citizens that couldn't enter because we had strict limitations on how many that could enter simultaneously during the pandemic. And I, I think that in general, we are quite bad ourselves at telling what is a public library. We get, we get into technical issues and academic issues. These are two poets telling us what the library is. Listen to this. Biblioteker är nya för någon. Välkommen. Detta är ditt. 
Biblioteket er en himmel, hver stjerne er en bok. Biblioteket er et hav, hver bok er en bølge. Jeg har vært her før. Det var her inne jeg fant et språk som var begynnelsen på mitt eget. Det var her jeg leste om de som sto opp for meg før jeg fantes. Biblioteket er en skog, hver leser er et tre som låner lys, som låner regn. Biblioteket er et sirkus. Det var her stemmen min startet. Jeg har aldri blitt hysja på her. Biblioteket er tid. Biblioteket er en vei. Biblioteket er deg. Biblioteket er deg. Det er du som åpner i dag. This model, shown on the screen now, shows in a very simplified way the transition from the traditional layout of a library building to the multi-purpose social space you find in many new libraries. The transition is brutal for the library organization because we have to work in a very different way. We primarily seek to make room for people and not for books. We create public spaces that are somewhere in between at home, a little relaxed and cozy, and at work or at school. Oslo public libraries are now third places, I would call. We are deinstitutionalizing the library. We go from being the owner of the library to hosting and facilitating what happens there. We give up our power and position by creating good digital self-service solutions, and we make sure that others use the library as their arena and platform and allow them to provide their content. So we are not only the provider of content. We create a space for experiences and learning where the books and lending of books are only a part of the offer and not the core. I'm going to show you now uh, some pictures. Um, it should be a film. It's the second film. Okay. Not this one. <laughs> The second one, from the branch library. Okay, I can start talking about it. It's, it's a, we will, if you will see it, you will see a branch library uh, that opened in January 2018. It's in a, in a suburb called Stovner. And it's uh, really a social space, a very good example of a social space. After the opening, the visits doubled. And the last year before the Biblioteket pandemic, we had also there 300. No, it's not this Velkommen. one. <laughs> Dette er ditt. Biblioteket er en himmel. Okay, if you don't find it, it's okay. At least uh, the number of visits uh, bent from 1,000 visits, 100,000 visits a year to 300,000 vis visits a year in the 12,000 square meter library. Uh, only 50% of the visitors actually use a book when they are in this library. So it's more a room for discussion, debates, learning, sharing, and spontaneous activity. 
um, often initiated by the citizens themselves. The owner of the modern library is not the librarians, I would say, it is the patron of the library. Uh, we are facilitators, hosts, and co-creators. Um, we are um, co-creating the library together, I would say, with the patrons. And people show up and they love it. Uh, we have had in all the branch library networks since we started this uh, change, an increase in visits. There you have it. Great. Woo. Let's, let's run the movie. <laughs> so that's the branch library. It's actually located in a shopping mall um, in an area of Oslo with a lot of social issues, with very high immigration. So it's, it's really a, a part of the city where, where the library can play a major role in certainly make people and young people come together and feel that they are kind of having their room, a very good room. So doing this transition in, in the branch libraries, we had a 40% increase in visits uh, during the last years before, uh, before the, the, the crisis. In the new main library, which is basically also developed in the same way, with the same kind of social spaces, uh, the increase in visits has been 700% um, from the old library, which also means that with higher capacity, but when you create these kind of new spaces, um, people come to the library that would usually not come to the library. We also have seen during this transition a 25% increase in book lending. Uh, and this is, this is also very important, of course. The book collection, when I say it's not important, that's, that's relative. I mean, the collection is still important, but you have to organize the room in a different way for it to be relevant and visible and accessible to the users. So in these rooms, like you can see here, you have a lot of social spaces, you have a lot of um, spaces where, for activity, and then we put the books wherever there are space left. So it's really the opposite way of planning library like we used to do it. We started very often with the book collection and then we created social spaces. Here we are mixing them together. So um, a modern public library is a third place, a space in between your home and your work, place or school. It's not so cozy as in your home, but not so cold and unpersonal as in your workplace or school. It's like an extension of your living room or your home. Um, a public library is one of the few public spaces where you can be alone and together at the same time. It's, it's socially acceptable to be alone without being stigmatized as lonely. It's also a unique place for starting friendships, knowing each other, knowing your neighbor, and experiencing that there are fewer things that are separating us and uniting us. Also, a modern library is a space for having fun, learn, and extend your horizons. It is a place where you can perform and share your own stories or skills. And in the main library now, we have a lot of different spaces for people to come with their own content, to perform themselves, and not only be the receiver of content. Patrons are not, no longer will, willing, really, and certainly not young people, to only be receivers. They want to contribute and to participate. Access to technology is not equal in society. Libraries have traditionally been good at promoting and increasing literacy. In a digital society, we must also work on digital literacy and giving access to tools, machines, technology that are usually um, equally dismissed in society. This is from the main library in Oslo now, Björvika, where we have sewing machines. And this is one of the most popular services. People come to the library to repair their clothes. Why should everyone have a sewing machine at home that they use once a year when they can come to the library repairing clothes, meeting someone that is good at it, having a friend? And then we have the books as well. Okay? And also having access to technology, modern technology. We have three podcast studios, for example, in the new library. Uh, and we have in branch libraries as well, where people can get trained in creating their own podcasts. 
Uh, and then we, know to, we need to know how to do it as well, so we have to train our staff for that. So the change in services, layout of the library, and need for new competence in the library represent a long process of development and change for staff. This has cost tears and hard labor for many of my colleagues. To say otherwise would be to underestimate reality. The real heroes here are the employees, the staff, here represented by MUTs, reading for young patrons. And in the main library, the change have been dramatic. I mentioned that it's 20,000 square meters building with four times larger public spaces than the old library. We have doubled the opening hours. We open at 8 in the morning and close at 10 in the, at night during the weekdays. We open at 10 on Saturday and Sunday and close at 6 all year around. We have six times, seven times more visitors, but basically the number of staff is the same. So you can imagine the change for the staff from the old library having maybe maximum 1,000 visits a day to the new library where we can on a good Saturday have 11,000 visits in one day. So I will show you now another movie. Uh, you will have a visit to the new main library. It's my colleague Merete, which is head of the, of the central library, that will take you on a tour. Um, and uh, explain in English what you will see. Welcome to Oslo, MA. Here in Björn Vika, close by the ocean and next neighbor to the Opera House and the Monk Museum. We have a wonderful building. Six floors filled with books, magazines, film, news, and wonderful places where we share, laugh, and meet other people. Here you can find all kinds of tools to enrich your life and to participate in the society. I will show you some of the more playful areas in the library and a wonderful place to start is on the third floor with the maker spaces. Hi, welcome to the maker space here in Björvika. My name is Asle and I work here at the maker space. We, here we have a lot of fun activities. Hey, come on, let's go and see. Here in Bjørvika you can make your own 3D models. We have equipment for that here. Or, if you want to sew your own clothes, we have a lot of things. When you've done your 3D modeling, you can come here and use all of our 3D printers. Or, if you want to make some artwork on your new sewn clothes, we have equipment for that. Let's move on to the music apartment. You will find a lot more than the books and the notes you expect to find there. Hey there! Welcome to the music department here in Bjørvika. Like the makerspace, you can do a lot of fun activities here too. You can learn how to play bass or drums. And if you want to record your own podcast, come on. You can do that here at our brand new sound studio. In the children's department, we have created a small world for kids and families. And I do believe we have about everything, almost everything, to make learning and reading fun and playful. The children's department here can play big and small screens. 
in the auditorium, you can listen to sound books. The department is full of literature for children. And it's even fun for grown-ups. On all the floors in the library, we have smaller or larger spaces created for art exhibitions. We have had about ambitions since we opened, but one uh, art project is not open to the public, but I'm eager to show it to you. This is the Future Library Project, created by Scottish Katie Patterson, made of wood from a small forest outside Oslo. In this small clearing, there is a forest growing. About 1,000 trees are planted. They will grow for a hundred years and will supply paper for an anthology made in hundred years. Each year is invited to contribute to the project with a manuscript. The manuscript will be kept in one of these beautiful boxes in the room. It will neither be read nor published until the hundred years have passed. And this project raises some fundamental questions about who we are, where we are, and what kind of future we deliver our next generation. It's a wonderful project and we are eager to show it to the rest of the world. So by this, I would like to welcome you all to Daika next time you're in Oslo. It's a wonderful library waiting for you here. I will um, end my lecture talking about our new strategy uh, for the time span 2021 to 2025. We have been working out our strategy during uh, our lifetime's probably most challenging crisis, the global pandemic. Our strategy for the next few, four years is ambitious and more focused on our city and our society's core challenges. The city of Oslo, like the global society, faces major challenges. Many people are lonely in big cities. People have less physical contact, and we at Dijkman must think anew about how we can contribute to creating unity and stronger local, local communities and more commitment among people. 50% of the households in the city of Oslo consists of one person. In our new strategy, we will build bridges between different groups in the population and make neighbors know each other better. In col collaboration with the local community, we will shift attention from activities aimed at certain target groups to activities that gather and build bridges across target groups. However, to obtain this goal, we must reflect Oslo's diversity. Oslo is a very diverse city. 30% uh, of the population are immigrants. Dijkman should reflect the population in content and organization, and we will go from talking about diversity to be diverse. So we are currently hiring people with cultural competence, language skills that we need in the library to be representative. We have just emerged from a pandemic crisis facing war in Europe. The most challenging topic, however, is the climate crisis. Sharing economy may be a part of the solution. Sharing is at the core of public libraries and it's sustainable. And we will make it easier for the population to share. It should be easy for Oslo's residents to share knowledge, ideas, views and experiences. And to succeed, to succeed in this, we must actively explore sharing technology. 
we must invite volunteering into libraries, and we must let users fill our spaces with their own content. The core values of modern de 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 democracy is actually in crisis. For decades, researchers have monitored different populations' opinion on how essential it is to live in a democracy. For decades, they have done this. And the percentage has fallen in most countries, like you can see here from the 30s. The new pictures shows us, the news pictures shows us how fragile dem democracy can be. Alternative facts, fake news, and echo chambers on social media are phenomena that polarized and put democracy to the red test. Fewer people participate in public debate, and many tend to seek information from sources with which they are already agreeing. We are becoming members of bubbles, social bubbles. The library will create commitment and contribute to the diversity of voices in Oslo. We will uh, counter echo chambers and encourage people to get actively involved in public debate, and certainly young people, they need to dare to speak up, use their voice, and we will help them doing that. We will have systematic cooperation with both local and national elected bodies in the library, give politicians and citizens a platform for dialogue in the library. And we will be the natural arena for meetings between citizens and elected representatives. This picture is from the party leader debate at the end of the national election last um, year. One of the national broadcasters rented space in the library for this event, and I think that's a very good example of the, what, how a public library can actually house a democratic event, important dem democratic event. Our last goal is that we must protect freedom of expression. All voices must be allowed in the library as long as they are within the legislation. And we should not exclude voices in the library. We know that words have consequences. Therefore, the job and assignment have never been more important than right now. As a library, we manage knowledge. We must be fact-based debate arenas. We will make science and professional knowledge available through collaboration with knowledge institutions like universities. We will establish debate series for and with young people in the libraries. And by facilitating dialogue and dissent, facts and source criticism and contributing to open debate, we will, I think, play a very important role in giving the people of Oslo a basis for independent opinions and attitudes. The library is very, very important, I think, in our times. So, this is not a public library. Do we still need public libraries? Yes, we do that. <laughs> if we have time, we will now see the full version of uh, the film from the main library that you tried to show earlier. <laughs> Biblioteker er nye for noen. Velkommen. Dette er ditt. Biblioteket er en himmel, der stjerne er en bok. Biblioteket er et hav, der bok er en bølge. Jeg har vært her før. Det var her inne jeg fant et språk som var begynnelsen på mitt eget. Det var her jeg leste om de som sto opp for meg før jeg fantes. Bibliotek er en skog, hver leser er et tre, som låner lys, som låner regn. Bibliotek er et sirkus.
Bibliotekaren var min första kärlighet. Det var här jag var fri. Det var här stämmen min starta. Jag har aldrig blivit hyssad på här. Biblioteket är en hållplats. Biblioteket är en by. Biblioteket är en himmel var bok är en sky. Biblioteket är höjt. Biblioteket är lågt. Det är grå lysning och inte lyd i by. Och jag är på väg till en uppbrett säng. Biblioteket er tid. Biblioteket er en vei. Biblioteket er deg. Biblioteket er deg. Det er du som åpner i dag. Biblioteket er deg. 